Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's June 17, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, living off the grid, authorities demand that a man's property be connected to city utilities. Then, a mob of black teenagers attacks a white family, but the mainstream media remains silent. And a disturbing video emerges of a cop murdering a 17-year-old kid for not complying with a traffic stop. All that plus much more, up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. We love our veterans, or at least we say we do. We always have them on the stage or at the halftime shows. And you can't turn on the TV without seeing some type of pro-military, pro-veteran uh, image on the screen. But what about if you're a veteran and you just decide to live off the grid? Well, they say that you're living an alternative lifestyle and refuse you from having the rights that you fought so hard to gain. Tyler Truitt didn't think his decision to live off the grid would impact anyone else. What is it? of their business what kind of uh, home that we choose to live in. He uses solar panels for heat and electricity, rainwater for drinking and bathing, and composting for sewage. Who are we bothering? That's, that's my biggest question, you know, is why? Who are we hurting? Now, I definitely do encourage you to go watch that full clip. The lady keeps saying he's living this alternative lifestyle. Alternative lifestyle, if he wants to live on a plot of land and, you know, have rainwater, that's his business. If he wants to live up in a treehouse and have rainwater, that's his business. He's not costing the city any type of money by doing that, but you know they always want to stick a, a thumb in your pie and get all up into your business. And in this example, they actually know who the guy is, and they will still want to hassle him about this. But now we have this new report analyzing the present and possible futures of U.S. veterans' population with CNOS and Palantir Metropolis. The available data on veterans is scattered, inconsistent, and in different formats. The Center for New American Security is the only think tank of its kind with a research team dedicated to veterans and military personnel, which basically means we have to go and find out where these veterans are. But as we just pointed out in our last uh, story, they know where this veteran is and they still want to harass him for something. I'm not saying this group, but just I'm talking about people in general. And it really is interesting to me, and I can't blame everything on Palantir and CNOS, but that's a whole nother story in and of itself. But we talk about our veterans. We don't know where these guys are. We don't know what type of treatment they need. Well, we have a veteran right here in this office, Joe Biggs, Staff Sergeant, U.S. Army retired, combat veteran. And he goes to the VA and he says, hey, my knee hurts. I need uh, something. I say, come back next week. He's like, well, it comes back next week. We'll have some shrapnel on my body. I'll come back next week. So the point I'm trying to make, as much as we say we love our veterans and we put them in halftime shows and all this stuff, we're not exactly treating them when they come home. And I'll be the first person to tell you, do I agree with everything the U.S. military does? No. Do I blame the individual soldiers for the actions that they're ordered to carry out? Absolutely not. You know, I may have uh, an exception with this mission or using drones in this particular fashion, but do I blame the individual soldier for following the orders? No, not at all. So these are the points we're trying to make when we talk about veterans. Yes, there are some things we have issues with, but that doesn't mean we hate the military in general. When these guys come back home when they're out there serving abroad. I want them to have the most support and everything they need to do the job in front of them, but also have a very humane job to be doing. And so now when I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, can we just start with the basic stuff? Can we get these guys health care? You know, these guys come back, they're all messed up. You know, some of them have PTSD, physical ailments, and nobody wants to help them. So, yeah, volunteer, you guys want to track everybody's uh, locations and all this stuff. Let's just start with getting them some basic health needs uh, taken care of. Now, since we're talking about health, let's talk about the health of the United States population. And this article, particularly from Anthony Gucciardi, where he points out how the average American woman now weighs as much as a man did back in 1960s. And it's not just all about the women. Also, the average American male has put on a good amount of weight, about 30 pounds or so. And that's going from the 1960s up to, I guess, about 2010. And this is a study from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, otherwise known as the CDC. Now, what's causing this? It's uh, any number of things. I think a very big contributor is GMOs. Now, we've talked at great length about companies like Monsanto, uh, all these frankenfoods that you eat when you go out, even uh, vegetables and fruits 
are being genetically modified with pesticides grown inside them. Now, that may not contribute to weight gain, but I do think it's probably bad to eat things with pesticides inside of them. And of course, you go to any fast, well, not any fast food restaurant, but a lot of these fast food restaurants, you have uh, GMO breads, all types of things. Like I said, also the vegetables, tomatoes, and all that good stuff. So be health conscious about what you eat. And I think people are becoming more health conscious because we talk about companies like McDonald's, their profits are plummeting. Companies like Subway, they're removing harmful chemicals out of their breads. And the list goes on and on and on. You know, a very big food advocate is one, the food bay, Vani Hari. You know, she's come under a lot of flack saying that she's a junk scientist. She's this, she's that. Regardless of what she is or isn't, I don't think she ever claimed to be a scientist. She's just a researcher who's trying to educate people about thinking about their foods in a vastly different way to kind of paraphrase what Eric Holder said. And I'm all for it. You know, keep educating people, not just her. The reason I bring her up, she's a great example of what just a normal average person can do if they really put their mind to something. And this is her issue, and I wish her all the best of luck. Wish you the best of luck in your health endeavors. Now we're going to switch gears entirely and talk about some racial violence going on in the country. It seems like every week we have a shooting of a a black teen by a white officer. Now, there are also shootings of black teens by black officers. We did the story earlier this year, just going off the top of my head here, about a couple of gentlemen were in a car. They get pulled over by a black officer. The black officer approaches the vehicle. Hey, can you give me your license and registration? Lo and behold, somebody reaches for the glove box where the license and registration is held. The officer completely freaks out, draws his gun. Stop it. Stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. So the guy says, hey, this is getting way too out of hand. I'm going to step out this vehicle with my hands raised. The cop shoots him dead right there on the spot. And that was a black-on-black -black situation there. But it's not just that. We have a situation now with a mob of black teens attacking a white family, and the media is silent. And this happened in Florence, the city of Florence, earlier this year. And a city, uh, excuse me, a family was out, you know, at a family gathering, and their 14-year-old son was initially hit from behind. And at first he thought someone had bumped into him, but he later found out that that was not the case and somebody was throwing fists at him. The father jumped in to protect his son and was attacked by a mob of 20 to 30 black teens. Now, when I say this, you know, you have plenty of examples of flash mobs, of uh, violent mobs, the pumpkin uh, fiasco that happened last year. They said, oh, these are just rowdy party, party goers, people smashing the pumpkins and doing all these wild things. You hear like a similar thing when uh, they have riots out over sporting events. Oh, those are just a bunch of rowdy party goers and stuff. But, you know, nobody wants to talk about it when it's a group of black people doing this. And I'm not bashing black people, obviously. I'm saying it's still a crime when they do it. You know, if you're going to call this group of uh, white attackers a mob, that's fine. But you also have to call this other group of attackers a mob as well. So it shouldn't be one-sided. And it reminds me of that situation. Uh, somebody was on a bus. It was a white man. And somebody walk, a black guy walks up to him. He says, hey, what do you think about, uh, was it Trayvon Martin or Michael Brown or one of those guys? He says, what do you think about this to the white man? The white man says, hey... You know, I just got off work. I don't feel like having this dialogue. And the guy punches him in the face. The black guy punches the white guy. That's wrong. And I would say the same thing if, uh, you know, it was a black guy sitting there in the chair and a white guy came up to him. Hey, what do you think about Kelly Thomas? Well, I don't feel like talking about that. If the white guy hit the black guy, I would say the white guy was in the wrong. So, you know, it's very much racially divided. So I really hope we could get to a point where it's not so much about race. It's just did the person do the crime? Yes. Yes or no. And then hold them accountable because of that, not just so much a racial issue. And that's kind of a very long-winded rant. We'll switch gears once again and talk about criminal informants. You know, feds under the beds, all these type of things that are going on. And, you know, you may be at an event. I've met people. I can't say that they're criminal informants or, you know, whatever. But I've met some very strange people who just ask me all types of strange questions. And in this new video that we're about to show you here... It points out how the person that you may be talking to could be a federal informant. See that dude in your local anarchist meeting? That weird guy at the mosque? Well, he might be an informant. Part of the big bad surveillance machine is a big network of informants, and they're charged with one simple task. Get information on groups and people that the government doesn't really trust. And since 9-11, the American informant network has grown into its own industry. In 1975, there were 1,500 paid FBI informants, and in 1980, 2,800. But in 2011, over 15,000. Now, to circle back to something that we mentioned earlier in our broadcast, we now have a video, Cop Murders 17-Year-Old Kid for Not Complying with a Traffic Stop. Now, this comes into play, do you have to abide with every order that you're given? Because we hear this a lot of times, 
Well, he wasn't agreeing or complying with 100% of what I told him to do. So it's one thing to stop somebody or maybe have a quick, quick chat. And I'm not saying all that stuff is well and good, but it's one thing to do that. And it's a completely different ball game to escalate it to the point where you actually pull out a gun and shoot the person. And here's a video of that. Dude. Out of the car or you're going to get tased. Everything's being recorded, son. I got no problem with that. <laughs> Arms out to the side. Are you all? I don't have a weapon. Hey! Get your... You can't do that. that! Get your hands behind your back. You're under arrest. You can't do that. Get your hands behind your back. Hey, officer, what are you get doing? Get your hands behind your back. You're officer. under... Officer. Ow! A sheriff's sergeant in Eaton County, Michigan, will face no charges after shooting and killing a 17-year-old for not complying with a traffic stop, despite the fact that he had committed no crime whatsoever. So this is where we run into following orders and fleeing from police and things like that. And they say, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to hide. You have no reason to ignore an order or run from the police. But the flip side of that, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why is he stopping me to begin with? So that's the situation that we run into with here. And, you know, things escalated. A lot of he said, she said. And, of course, you know, one of the he's is dead in this. So it's a very unfortunate situation. And uh, hopefully, you know, we've had a lot of riots, a lot of uh, different things going on in the country just in the short time that I've worked here. And things really don't seem to be getting a whole lot better. And uh, I'm not sure what it's going to take to hold these officers accountable. Now, when I talk about these stories, I'm not trying to generalize police in general, because I had a chance to talk to a, a police chief one time. He said, hey, don't blame me for stuff that I didn't do. Don't blame me for the stuff that's going on in Ferguson or Baltimore or Cleveland or any of these other places. Just blame me for the things I do and the things that my department does. And I said, fair enough, chief. But then you have these situations when their officers go out and do something and nobody gets held accountable. You know, like some guy will be out filming police, you know, with a, enough space that a, a horse can walk between them, literally, happened here in Austin and somebody snatches the guy's phone, and then another officer comes up and pepper sprays the guy in the face, and it's like, well, you shouldn't have been rushing the officer. Like, what video were you watching? He did not attack, rush, yell, scream, spit, anything at the officer. He was attacked for standing there with his cell phone in the United States of America. He had enough room to drive a freaking horse in between there. It's all kinds of stuff. I'm not sure what it's going to take. And a lot of people say, what's the answer? I don't have definitive answers. I'm up here telling you what happened today, you know, what happened last week you know, maybe a prediction about what may happen next week. I don't have all the answers. You know, the answers are within yourself. We'll talk about that with our guests coming up. But uh, just do what you can to make these things stop in your community. And we'll end tonight with this before we go on to more special reports. Florida chief under fire for preaching in uniform. Wouldn't the world be better if everyone behaved like a Christian? Polk County Sheriff Grady Judd spoke from the pulpit of First Baptist Church at the mall in Lakeland two months ago. And as you can see, he was in full uniform. The Freedom of Religion Foundation sent this letter to the sheriff accusing him of excluding other religions and making non-believers feel like outsiders in their own community. I was invited to this church, just like I am to many churches, just like I am to many secular events, to speak. And this story is very interesting to me because it seems like another persecution of Christians. Because this Christian guy did this, this Christian guy did that. Uh, you know, you can't be a Christian if you go to places like Fort Hood. You know, it's okay to piss in a jar that has Jesus in it. But if you dare draw a, pif uh, a picture of the Prophet Muhammad, then, you know, you're asking for it. You're really egging these people on to come and attack you. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Because if we have these events where you can, you know, you know, urinate on Jesus and do these other things. You can put up a picture of a dog's anus and say it looks like Jesus. And that's all well and good. It's fun and games. Ha, ha, ha. But on the flip side of that, had a radical Christian, so-called quote-unquote Christian, wouldn't attack these news agencies that put that out. They said radical hate group, da, 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 da. But on the flip side of that, and I'm not trying to make this a Christian versus Muslim kind of deal. I'm just using this as an example. When you have situations like what Miss Geller is doing, having these uh, cartoonist events and stuff like that. Oh, she's asking for it. She's bringing it on. But on the flip side, like I said, if a Christian wouldn't attack these other news agencies, they'd be like, oh, that's, they're so horrible, and they shouldn't have done that to us. And once again, you know, Geller does what she does. I personally wouldn't do anything like that, but, you know, I don't think it's worth killing anybody over. Um, it just, just thoughts going off the top of my head. And it's just more that we see. You know, you can be a different type of group, and it's not all religious. And like I said, I'm not trying to, you know, bash on the Muslims or whatever. 
myself and Joe Biggs went out to the stand with a profit event before the Garland shooting that was happened that happened in Garland a few months prior. Everybody we met out there was nice, peaceful Muslim people. They're out there praying. They shook our hands. We, you know, taking pictures and stuff like that. It was all good. So I'm not blaming Muslims in general. That's just one example of the things that go on in this continued, not even diversity, but division that we have in this country. It always has to be some type of issue that just gets so hot that people feel like they have to go out and commit violence over it when uh, hopefully we can just find some type of way to just let's all get along. Well, that was kind of my preaching there for the segment. But stay tuned. We have many more reports to come after this break. We have a special report from John Bowne, also some other reports. How's your gallbladder? This is something I never even thought about until they ran a report the other day talking about gallstones, kidney stones are actually quite nasty and something that you may want to consider getting rid of in the near future, especially if you don't have the best diet or if you drink, things along that nature. You will be disgusted by this, but disgusted in a good way and encourage you to do something. Stay tuned. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Buried in the memory hole of modern civilization lies the immoral, corrosive culture of the world's elite. Last week, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the former head of the International Monetary Fund, candidate for the French presidency, and Bilderberg attendee, closed another chapter on a saga rife with perversion. A French court acquitted Khan of aggravated pimping, claiming that Khan did not help operate an illegal prostitution network. The Carlton Affair is named after one of the hotels where businessmen and police officials allegedly organized sex parties that took place in Brussels, Paris and Washington. Khan said he was present at the orgies attended by lawyers, judges, police officials and journalists because he was overwhelmed with stress dealing with saving the world's economy as the head of the IMF. That stress really must have gotten to him when he sexually assaulted a maid in a Times Square hotel only hours before he was scheduled to meet with German Chancellor Angela Merkel. In the UK, Scotland Yard is finally launching an inquiry into the 30 plus year cover up of child sex abuse rings perpetrated by judges, politicians, intelligence officers, and staff at the royal palaces. It would later be revealed that Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's protege, Leon Britton, was at the center of the cover-up and was under investigation for raping a woman and sexually abusing boys up until his death this year. He was back at the center of controversy last year amidst questions over his handling of allegations of sexual abuse when he was Home Secretary 30 years ago. A sad day for the survivors of child sex abuse because they would have wanted to hear from uh, Sir Leon Britton at this inquiry in terms of what he knew about the allegations uh, that were made during the 1980s. In 2014, former Obama staffer Donnie Ray Williams pleaded guilty to raping two women. He drugged the first one with Ambien and raped the second one after she was so intoxicated she couldn't give proper consent. In 2013, William suffered an acid attack to his face and body by an unknown man. He used this attack as an excuse to sway the judge to give him five years probation rather than any prison time. And this only scrapes the surface of the many allegations weighing on the overall perception of the ruling elite. The report is a devastating critique of the Vatican's performance in dealing with child sex abuse. It says it's still not willing to recognize the scale of the problem or take responsibility for it. The church is still moving guilty abusers from parish to parish to avoid prosecution. That must stop. 14 French soldiers who were working as UN peacekeepers in the Central African Republic have been accused of sexually abusing refugee children and feeding them only in exchange for sex. I didn't know this. The thing was Bohemian Grove back then, nor did the kid when he was writing it. All he knew was he was taken to this place. Right now, this is Benassi, a kid named Paul Benassi writing this, and this is directly word for word from his diary. I went in January of 84 on every trip. I was paid by men King knew for sex. In the summer of 84, sometime, I went to Dallas, Texas, and had sex with several men King knew in a hotel. I flew on YNR Airlines, by the way, that's a private airline or just private charter deal, and Cam Airlines, another private charter deal. King flew me out on a private plane from Epley Airfield in Omaha to Denver where we picked up Nicholas, a boy who was about 12 or 13. Then we flew to Vegas. Nicholas and I were driven to an area that had big, big trees. It took about an hour to get there. There was a cage with a boy in it who was not wearing anything. Nicholas and I were given these Tarzan things to put around us and, and stuff like that. They told me to 
I won't use the word, uh, blank the boy and stuff. In other words, have sex with him. At first I said no, and they held a gun to my uh, genitals, I'll use the word, and said do it or else lose them. I didn't know that the thing was Bohemian Grove back then, nor did the kid when he was writing it. All he knew was he was taken to this place. Blank him and stuff and beat on him. I didn't try to hurt him. We were told to put our blanks in his mouth and stuff and sit on the boy's blank and stuff, and they filmed it. We did this stuff to the boy for about 30 minutes or an hour when a man came in and kicked us and stuff in the genitals uh, and picked us up and threw us. He grabbed the boy and started blanking him and stuff, and the men tossed me and him and stuff and put the boy right next to me and grabbed the gun and blew the boy's head off. The boy's blood was all over me, and I started yelling and crying. The men grabbed Nicholas and I and forced us to lie down. They put the boy on top of Nicholas, who was crying, and they were putting Nicholas' hands on the boy's blank. They put the boy on top of me and did the same thing. They then forced me to blank the dead boy. Everything, including when the men put the boy in a trunk, was filmed. This loathsome lack of moral latitude, fomented by the ruling elite, seeps to the surface like a toxic chemical, attempting to gather the hearts and minds of Americans to be integrated into the elite's modus operandi of the common culture. But the good people of America are many, regardless of the media's grip on politics, music, and entertainment. In a speech to the military in 1798, John Adams warned his fellow countrymen, saying, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. John Bound for Infowars.com. Let's call Shaquille O'Neal right now. This is his phone number. We'll see what happens. Call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. He answered two days ago. All right, yeah, fade it back up once the number's done, and I'll leave a message. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Hey, Shaq, it's Alex Jones calling. A, a mutual friend gave me your number, and I just wanted to say that Look, you shouldn't fire the folks at that company. I have nothing to do with the company. You should try to defend free speech. I, I understand that it's that it's your website, and, and, and you have a right to tell them that you don't want them to do it anymore. Uh, but the fact is, the majority of Americans in major polls, you can look them up, believe 9-11 was an inside job. The 28 secret pages have been partially leaked by congressmen and senators, and Saudi Arabia was behind the attacks. Our government stood down. And Shaq... Being a basketball player, being narcissistic, being arrogant, that'll get you nowhere in your short life. You're probably a very unhappy person because worldliness will never fully fulfill you. Uh, you will feel fulfilled if you stand up for humanity and really do something. So please look into false flag stage terror. Please care. Please don't be a coward. And find out that Fast and Furious was staged to blame the Second Amendment. Uh, find out that, that George Soros is trying to get riots against the police going. Uh, Charles Barkley, one of your colleagues who actually thinks he's a smart guy, uh, has talked about that, uh, and just realize that playing it safe with the establishment at the end of the game is not smart because the establishment, just like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia, is getting ready to screw everybody over. So, uh, Mr. O'Neill, again, I'm Alex Jones. If you'd like to contact us, I'll try to call you back at a later date when we're off air uh, and have a further discussion with you. So maybe you can come on the radio show and explain to us why you think it's disrespectful and distasteful uh, to question 9-11. I think it's patriotic to question a government known to lie. Our own government's funding ISIS and al-Qaeda in Syria right now, and, well, I helped expose all that with my audience, and we're not going to stop, Mr. O'Neill. In fact, we're all owed a apology by the establishment who said that we were evil for questioning 9-11. It was almost as if it were a planned implosion. It just pancaked. Well, pancaking almost like a precision implosion. Reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. All not a simple person up. We will wait for that collapse. And welcome back. A pretty heavy issue that doesn't get talked about that much is human trafficking, modern-day slavery. Now, a lot of people, when they think about slavery, they think about the, the people out in the fields, the cotton fields, and so forth. And it didn't end there. You have sex slavery. You have, of course, labor slavery, all types of indentured servitude, child soldiers, all types of things all over the globe. But it's not just all over the globe. It's right here in the United States of America. 
You have the sex workers. You have many other types of people who are forced to do things without their consent, without their will. These things are forced upon them. And how do people get into all these situations? I'm not an expert, but we have somebody who is Govinda Tidball. All right, thank you for joining us today, Govinda. Hey, good to see you, Jakari. How are you doing? Doing very well. So tell us about your project and how you got involved with it. Um, okay, well, the initiative is called Human 2020. Um, it is based off of that global pledge that was made towards the end of 2014 by all spiritual leaders in the world to see an end to human trafficking by the year 2020. And um, this is more of a civil society business community initiative along that same line to see an end to what is essentially modern day slavery. Um, and for people that have been around or, or been connected to this issue at all, we see that modern day slavery in its current forms is continuing to grow as a business globally. So it has continued to exponentially grow. And in order for any kind of change to happen in this particular issue, it's gonna take everyday people like yourself, myself, all of us getting engaged in the issue, understanding what it is, and then knowing what each of us can do about it. So um, this started off just as an initiative and it's just picking up steam uh, everywhere in Austin. Um, we've got something coming up tomorrow. Um, we were planning on maybe a thousand people. We have 1600 coming out. Um, it, it's so it's picking up quickly because most people want to see an end to um, this problem, not just in the U.S., but also around the world. Well, let's start with that. Tell us about the, um, the initiative, the um, program that's going on tomorrow here in the city of Austin. A lot of people will be watching this the next day on YouTube. So it's this coming Thursday in the city of Austin, Texas. So go Ben to tell us about the, um, the program. Sure. So, so um, tomorrow, uh, Austin's known for a few things around the world. One thing, we have a very, very strong art community in Austin. So um, one of the leading art galleries here in our art studios in Austin is a place called Canopy. So we have a set of Austin's professional uh, leading artists here, uh, almost 20 of them have put together artwork specifically around the issue of human trafficking. Um, Jen Hessen, uh, she's the, the lead artist on this, former Air Force Serviceman of the Year. And they've just put together some great stuff. Part of it is to help people understand um, that one, this issue is going on today, and also to um, encourage them a dialogue on it, on what each of us can do. So most people don't even know that today the global price point for a human being is 90 to 100 bucks. Wow. I that's, mean, yeah. yeah, so it's it's they don't realize that 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 there are almost 36 million people enslaved around the world today. They don't realize that it is a 150 billion dollar a year industry that has um, that is continuing to grow at an exponential rate um, that it is built on supply and demand and the two are being connected all the time. So, so what, we, what we're seeing is um, that the nonprofit sector itself, it will never be able to fix this problem. The governments are, have all of their other issues. The only way that you'll ever see a change in this issue is when you and I become part of that solution. So the Human 2020 initiative is along that same lines. It's saying, okay, what can you, what can I do, um, even if it's in a small way to contribute to the solution. And what can we do? What can the average person watching this video right now do to get involved? Okay, well, I'll give you a few small things. There's some things that we can do that cost no money. Um, a very simple one that we actually started to uh, is something called 20 on 20, where basically on the 20th of every month for 20 minutes, whatever your um, spiritual background may be. So if you have a spiritual background um, with you know, maybe, maybe you, uh, whatever your faith is, spend 20 minutes on that day and just spend that time in, um, put that towards um, petitioning for the end of, of modern day slavery. And you can do that, whatever your faith is, whatever your background is, because you have the moral imperative on your side. And, and people are doing this right now. They're doing it online, they're doing it in communities. They're, they're, uh, I just spoke to somebody that connected with a bunch of uh, yoga studios and they're gonna do like meditations on once a month for 20 minutes. So it's just something very simple you can do. There's another one too, 
um, where just um, we have some some people that are associated with this as well. They do crowdsourcing of um, so there's a group out of uh, Los Angeles, the Orphan Secure. They do crowdsourcing of uh, uh, information from uh, from just you and I, people that are out there that have smartphones that are able to communicate in the um, the just whatever they see, and they're able to compile that information together and start a case file for local law enforcement around the world. They just brought 100 kids out of trafficking in the Philippines, um, and they're they're prosecuting five corrupt cops over there Good. based on just what civil society communicated in and in order once that that information is shared in there because sometimes law enforcement has a hard time um beginning to even start a case but when you and i report in and say here's what's going on um and they have that case file they can actually take that and then follow up appropriately so there's there's those are little things that you and i can do i think also getting educated about the issue understanding how the supply and demand works with the trafficking, um, with with human trafficking around the world, understanding that um, that small things that we do make an effect. Uh, just even what we buy, the companies we support. I'll, I'll, I'll translate this to to another area which you guys have, have covered well on Infowars is the issue of genetically modified foods. Mm -hmm. As people are are not buying certain products, uh, those industries are continuing to lose ground. And we're seeing a, a strong push for real food and and things that are good for people. So so likewise, we all vote with um, our intentions. We vote with our time. We vote with wherever we put our resources. So it's telling people to to become aware, become engaged on this particular issue, and be part of that solution. Even if it's if it's a small way, we can all do something. Very good, very good. Now let's talk about the issue of modern day slavery, because a lot of people think. You know, here in the States, you know, slavery was done pretty much after the Civil War. But there's different types mm -hmm. of slavery. There's sex slavery. There's labor slavery. So let's talk about a few of these areas. And, you know, what do you think is real prevalent to people here in the States? What type of slavery? Well, most people don't know that in the States you have uh, between 200 to 300,000 Americans enslaved inside the United States right now, today. So most people don't even know that, that there are this many young girls that are trafficked even within the U.S., that there's 17,500 uh, non-Americans that are trafficked in to the U.S. every year. So most people don't know that there's more slaves uh, in the United States than live in Amarillo, Texas right now. Wow. That this is what's going on today in this country. Most people don't know that the average age of entry into the sex trafficking industry is 12 years old. Um, most people don't know that um, more people are purchased that, that uh, three out of four victims of sex trafficking are purchased online. So these are kind of things that most people don't know that married men are the biggest buyers of, of uh, that they buy more trafficked people than non-married men. Really? Wow, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, so, so the thing is, most people don't know that less than 1% of trafficking victims are ever identified. So 99% of victims of trafficking are never rescued. So it's it's a and even when they are identified, it is less than a ten percent conviction ratio. So uh, so when they even find somebody that is a traffic victim, the the actual trafficking recourse is very very low. So we are talking about, or you mentioned that a lot of these young girls are getting very young. There's also men as well, young boys. Yes, absolutely. But from your research and the research of your group, about how how do people get into this? You know, are they kidnapped? Uh, are they runaways? What happens? Well, there's, there's a mixture. I mean, when we do talk about trafficking, this is, again, back to uh, the business side of it. It's supply and demand. So what is it that people are demanding and what is it that people are, are supplying? Trafficking in and of itself preys on vulnerability and poverty in a lot of cases. But a lot of times, too, just because people are unaware. And, um, you know, you, you get sets of people that just think, oh, free trip to Miami, and so they, they go. But as soon as somebody gets put into that situation, they are along for the ride, and they don't ever get out. So um, because of the illegal organ trade, for example, uh, illegal adoption, other countries with issues like child soldiers, it, it's, it's a, a lot of times it is just that connection between vulnerability, poverty. But when somebody, it, it preys on the weakest in our societies. So human trafficking in and of itself will always prey on those that are the most vulnerable in our societies. And that's why, Jakari, part of what it takes is it's going to take 
those that are the strongest in our societies and, and the real men out there, like, like guys like you and Alex and, and the rest, to also stand up and say, okay, this is the situation, this is what needs to be done, and we are going to take it to the forefront. So I'll, I'll give you something that we put out, too. We put out a, 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 a letter to all of the presidential candidates, everybody running right now, both sides of the aisle. It doesn't matter because this is not a political issue. Mm -hmm. And we said, for anybody running from 20, for 2016, 2020, what's your plan? We invited them all to Austin for this, what's coming up this next week. They don't have to buy an audience. We have 1,600 people showing up. Come on out. And so, but here's the thing. We, we want to know if you are going to be the president of the United States, then make this a, a political issue, because this, is this is the moral issue of our day. Let's hear what your plan is. Let's hear what you are going to do in your presidential run during 2016, 2020, and this issue that everybody in the world wants to see end. Anybody that is not part of the problem wants to see a solution. And the majority of people that are out there want to see a solution to this issue. Great. Now, so we would like to see that. Yes. Well, let's talk about that just briefly. Have you had any response from those uh, candidates? You know, we we've it's actually it's been a bit disappointing with some of them because they've got their political machines going and and they just do their rote responses. We have had some feedback. Um, Ted Cruz's office, they their scheduler was talking to us a little bit, but they said he had an appointment on on Thursday and so he wasn't able to come. Uh, a little bit back from Ben Carson. Um, we, we've, we've, you know, we, we may have some of the local people closer to the venue that'll join us. Mm -hmm. Not, not, uh, not anybody that actually is up to speed on the issue of human trafficking by um, what they've, they've been able to say. I mean, we're still waiting. We would love to see over this next going into 2016. We would love to see on both sides of the aisle, whoever wins. What are they going to do to be part of fulfilling that global pledge? Because if somebody is going to run for the office of president of the United States, you better tell us what it is that you are going to do in that position to actually solve this issue. Because the moral mandate falls on the person that will be president of the U.S. And if they can't come forward to the plate and say what their plan is, they have no business running for office in the first place. This is one of the moral issues of our day right now. Human trafficking has grown grown globally um, almost 15 times. It's gone up 1,400% from 2007. Over the last eight years, 2007 to 2015, it has gone up 1,442%. If you go to ILO, IOM statistics, it was a $10.4 billion a year industry in 2007. Today, it is a $150 billion a year industry. So what is going to be done with, with this issue by the people that are in positions of power. And this is not something happening overseas. This is happening in the U.S. Yes. right now, today. And that's the thing, that, that this is what's going on in our country, as well as overseas. So people want the position, but they can't tell us what they're going to do with it. Exactly. Now, there's a whole lot we could talk about this, and I'm uh, hoping to get out there and see you at the event tomorrow. But we'll end on this That'd note, and then uh, definitely give us uh, the contact information for anybody who's interested in the initiative. But I want to ask you, I've seen several documentaries, exposés, you know, Nightline, stuff like that, where they talk about people who are involved in the, the sex trade, sex workers, prostitutes. And you know, it's yeah. always kind of this debate, do they choose this line of work? Are they forced in it? Uh, from your research, is it either or? Is it both? Or what do you think about it? You know, that, that's, that's kind of, again, one of the... Um, kind of the outlier issues that, you know, sometimes people will, will debate. Uh, I, you know, I, I think, um, I don't know how graphic I, I can be on air. And I'll say what I you got to say. This, but I, well, you know, there was recently at the, at the University of Nebraska, they had one, uh, a lady um, was, she, she stood up and asked the same question to one of the lead speakers there. And he told the lady, well, you go and um, suck a thousand bucks. And come back after that, and you tell me this is something that budget was. So, as far as it's it's the issue of what trafficking is, how much people get used, and how much people are abused in this specific thing. It is a meat grinder. The issue of prostitution in and of itself, what woman starts out her life 
thinking about that she wants to sell her body as her profession. And it is not the oldest profession, it is the oldest oppression in the world. Mm. So we, we've, we've slipped a long way as humanity into the kind of things that we tolerate, the kind of things that we um, allow to come to the front and even debate these issues. So what we is looking at has continued to go forward in the darkness. And what we need to do is we need to have a strong debate, a strong realization, and people need to come to the forefront as part of the solution, even if it's in a small way. And they need to, um, from that point, they can. And if enough of us continue to move forward, we will see things change, and we will see an end to this modern-day slavery. Very good, very good. So tell us about the site, give out the information, and also what people need to know for the event tomorrow in Austin. Sure. Um, just the site's human2020.com, H-U-M-A-N 2020.com. You can just drop an email, info at human2020.com. That's good enough. Um, the event tomorrow in Austin, it'll be over at Canopy, uh, 916 Springdale Road. And um, yeah, just come on out. It's an open event. Um, there's an exhibition there. There's different things that are going to be going on there. Uh, there'll be the Austrian Acro community should be out there too. So there'll be people doing some great um, uh, circusy type stuff. There's, it's just going to be a lot of a lot of things going on. We're also going to be giving some information out to people tomorrow. Um, I got one of these here. We got a thousand of these that are going to go out, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll send you a, a PDF of this, Jakari. But it's just basically some information too to help people understand the actual issue and um, to actually understand some of the things that are going on, some of the stats that are out there. And this is also a closed population, in, or, or I should say hidden population. A lot of what people know about this issue is horrific narratives, but the actual numbers are, are tough to get at. And a lot of times uh, the people that are working on this issue, they're, they're working against um, very heavily funded and, and uh, uh, um, uh, just systems that are in place that are, are at all different levels. So, so, so in order to build that awareness and build that dialogue, um, this is going to require each of us just taking that initial step and and like you like you've already done yourself, you know, watching some documentaries, starting to understand a bit more about the issue. But the main thing too is that this is a supply and a demand issue. And in order to effectively work on this, we have to work on both the supply side and the demand side. Uh, you know, one other thing that can be done on the demand side is support some legislative reform. You know, we saw this in in the Nordic laws where they criminalized buying. Once that was done, that drastically dropped demand in that place. We, let's let's see that happen in the U.S. Let's see that happen throughout. Because once what, one of the things, that, the reasons that even criminal organizations are moving towards trafficking is because there's very little follow-up and very little prosecution. So we have to shift that to cut the demand. All right, go Vinda Tidball. Definitely thank you for your time and look forward to seeing you at the event. Thanks so much, Jakari. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. All right. Take care. All right, bye. Well, that's it for our show tonight. And if you